Hello, this is Dr. Scott Catino of Henley Putnam University, and today I'd like to deliver a, a video lecture on Ho Chi Minh entitled, Ho Chi Minh, America's Most Capable Foe. This truly is an extraordinary subject, and as we examine particularly the strategic leadership of this individual, I would like the, the listener, those who are watching this video, to just take a moment to look at my thesis statement or my main point here. Why pick Ho Chi Minh out among all the enemy or hostile leaders who waged war against the United States? Well, I think if we look at Ho Chi Minh, we will find that he was an extraordinary enemy in that he was able to achieve so much. He was not only able to achieve... Uh, actually not even during his lifetime, but after his lifetime through his plans, the very goal that he had sought out, and that was the unification of Vietnam, the conquest of the South, and more so to export communism throughout Indochina, Cambodia, obviously, and Laos. He achieved his dream of creating this Indo-Chinese communist movement, which he articulated so openly. But even beyond that and beyond his death, we find out that... Ho Chi Minh is a model of insurgents that enemy combatants and insurgents throughout the world, including Al Qaeda today, look to Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Cong and the communist Vietnamese, not only for inspiration, but for tactical expertise and in asymmetrical warfare. So if we look at this extraordinary influence and how deeply he scarred the American public and was able to influence its thinking and weaken the will of our political leaders, we see truly this was a very capable enemy and an individual who possessed, and this is the key point, strategic leadership capabilities. The objective of this video lecture is to examine these strategic leadership capabilities, the ability to directly influence strategy and to do so against an opponent. I have here in this statement underlined his leadership included extraordinary personality qualities, international support building skills, organizational skills, and military deception that have to be looked at synergistically because they work this way. He was able to use these synergistically to create strategic effects uh, that became America's most difficult war. And I'm using that term because it was a direct quote from President Richard Nixon who referred to the Vietnam War in those terms. So the objective here, again, is to look at Ho Chi Minh, to particularly look at these strategic leadership skills. Indeed, it's difficult to pick out one particular leader and then brand that person as America's most capable foe. But Ho Chi Minh was truly among the most deadly opponents that the United States had faced. And to study his strategic leadership skills is, cer is certainly a worthwhile time uh, for those interested in strategic security. Let's first of all look at his personality characteristics and the strategic effects created. We so easily and flippantly use terms like charisma, a certain leader being charismatic. But what does that mean particularly for those of us who are interested in examining from an intelligence perspective and a security perspective a personality trait. Ho Chi Minh possessed this aspect called charisma. It was an ability to not only attract followers, but to hold them, to create partnerships, to cultivate and exploit relationships, associates, and even allies. He had this extraordinary ability, and it comes through in his writings as well as uh, in the documentation of those who studied his movement. The second characteristic was his discipline. And again, this is not necessarily something that's complex, but when an individual possesses such discipline, such energy, secrecy, and patience, it's very important to understand that this will be a higher order or higher caliber opponent. And when we begin to build upon these character traits, charisma and discipline, as well as his ability to survive, his ability to uh, evade and to move so stealthily and instinctively, we see that we have a combination of characteristics that begin to create such an extraordinary opponent. The last is certainly not least here that I have listed, his strategic thinking. This strategic sensibility that he possessed is something that 
individuals who study strategy note is is a skill that one is born with. It's difficult to cultivate it. It, it truly can be cultivated. Ho had the natural talent, and through his experience as an insurgent, as well as his study, he was able to refine this and use it so extraordinarily. And as a result of this, we find strategic effects. He was able to do something which is very much overlooked, and that was to maintain the support of the international communist movement, the communist bloc. That's something that's overlooked. Strategic leadership certainly involves being able to maintain and develop a critical alliance. Ho Chi Minh was able to not only ingratiate himself with the movement, but to survive the terrible violence that was taking place inside the movement at the time. Many communist leaders were not only alienated, were ostracized, but were outright killed and executed. Ho Chi Minh was able to survive that, to be able to put up with the personalities, the changes, the betrayals that were taking place in the movement and to stay above that and actually to cultivate it to his very own ends. It truly is a skill and one that should be paid attention to when we're analyzing foreign leaders. Case in point, Ho Chi Minh at one time, uh, when he had failed in his early years and was actually captured by British authorities and then turned over to the French, and later he was released, it, it had come to uh, the attention of his communist masters at the time, and there were several people that, that actually had voted in a meeting that Ho Chi Minh should be executed. Um, however, there was another member of, of the Communist International who intervened for Ho Chi Minh, and that obviously didn't take place. His very patient building of the Communist Revolution, the Vietnamese Communist Party, was something that definitely calls attention to his discipline. Rather than being flamboyant, rather than being overzealous or overeager to build, his very patient step-by-step -step construction of the Communist Revolution is something to pay attention to. That is not to say that his discipline did not identify large opportunities taking place. Although a very patient step-by-step, -step, this is the term that the communist movement used, and inculcated symmetrically throughout the organization uh, took place, there was a time for, as the communists would call it, leaping, taking advantage of opportunities that, as they existed. Ho Chi Minh certainly did this very well, and certainly not perfectly, the ability to bounce back from a, a setback is another skill in and of itself. But Ho Chi Minh certainly demonstrated this extraordinary patience in revolutionary building, as well as an ability to exploit opportunity when it arrived. Again, his ability to evade French and other security services that were operating in Indochina is, is truly a, an ability that all insurgents who survive must master, or indeed they will perish. And if we look at his patterns of strategic alliances with nationalists, the Soviets, the Chinese, and later on with the French, etc., we do see an individual that is able to exploit these very effectively and understand them, and it's a point we'll talk about later. But if we begin to do this in our analysis from a strategic perspective, we're able to look at these personality tra traits and how they affect strategic outcomes, we will begin to see these extraordinary leadership characteristics and what is important to identify when we examine leaders. I'm using one quote here. I could have used many. And this is the type of theme that emerged in a study of Ho Chi Minh, certainly one that I found. When we, we look at educated individuals, we're not talking about just simple people who are prone to acting emotionally. We're talking about highly educated students. We're talking about individuals that were advanced in their political thought. Having an encounter like this individual here who notes this um, in this source, being so simply drawn to Ho Chi Minh and being able to find an affinity with this individual. It's it's a rare talent. It truly is. And it's something that marks enemy leadership, certainly those who are very effective in their leadership. And please take a moment to look over this quote.
This next part is important to understand in Ho, Ho Chi Minh ability to develop international support. Quite simply, insurgents and enemy leaders that are able to do this are, de are able then to develop a capability that exponentially increases the power of their movement. There's quite a bit of debate on whether Ho Chi Minh was a national or communist, and I'm going to leave that aside for a moment because Ho Chi Minh operated in such a unique realm, he was able to exploit both. Ho Chi Minh was certainly not a nationalist in the sense that he embraced nationalism as an ideology, being concerned with the traditions, the customs, the people, and certainly the boundaries of Vietnam itself. He was a communist in that, not that he was a mere ideologue, but he saw in it the ability to gain power and to use it so effectively, to wield it as a weapon. The vibrant nationalist movement, VNQDD was the name of it, the abbreviation of it in Vietnam, was one of several major nationalist movements that Ho Chi Minh was able to co-ops so effectively and able to work with these individuals as well as the communists in his time period, as well as those who were of the left, both nationally and internationally, creating tactical alliances that served his immediate interests step by step to build his communist revolution. His extraordinary ability to manage these waves of political movement and then to use it to carry him in the direction that he wanted to go is an extraordinary study all of itself. But Ho Chi Minh was able to gain area access and intelligence and resources. This is important to understand, this capability, because it's easy to overlook it. As we see the communist movement in Vietnam developing and spreading throughout Indochina, he's able to cross from rural to urban terrain. He's able to move from north to south. He's able to gain valuable resources and build these networks. And it's just not a minor skill. It's, it's the details prove the capabilities and what he achieved. So Ho Chi Minh not only makes these linkages, he's able to develop these networks by piecing together hubs of of human movement of various capabilities of various political sentiments and, and use these to create networks to move his personnel his resources as well as information and to sustain his movement i use the term here transmission belts you know, in addition to developing these capabilities that i just mentioned he's able to access people in the media very important individuals throughout Western Europe, in France in particular, as well as the United States. And he creates these transmission belts, which he achieves in the 1930s and 1940s, and he will use these throughout the war in Indochina and well into what he called the American War in the 1960s and 70s. So his infra information operations, his propaganda that proved to be so effective and so deeply penetrated the United States, um, was the result of something he had created in the 1930s by accessing the right people and education in the media and human rights organizations, people that he called progressive people, some overtly and some covertly. It so deeply affected uh, the public will and the sentiment in the United States, and yet he had created this decades prior to those actual events. It's interesting when we look at Ho Chi Minh's organizational skills, and I think no higher compliment can be paid to this evil genius than the fact that his opponents copied his organizational skills and attempted to build, in, in contrast, in opposition, movements and organizations to fight the communists, but using the very techniques and procedures and organizations that Ho Chi Minh had used. He creates this very powerful organization because of these skills which I believe are very strategic. And the first one is I like to call nesting. We hear so much of organizational building creating created through sanctuaries. We often find if we study either the Taliban or the or any Islamic terrorist group from Afghanistan like the Akani network or if we move to a little a little earlier in history I should say when we look at the, the Algerian insurgent movements that, that took place, or just picking any insurgent movement, we find that creating a sanctuary, often in a foreign country, and doing so covertly, 
through penetrating the social and political networks and particularly gaining the foreign support of a country, an enemy country, um, often creates sanctuary. But Ho Chi Minh did something in addition to that. And he did this so well, and that is the skill of nesting. In the early days, he he had the support of the Soviet Union and China, this is true, but he still had to move throughout Europe. He had to move uh, uh, throughout China, even when he had to move in areas that were hostile, infiltrating and exfiltrating. He had to stay specifically in areas such as the United States or the when he was in the United Kingdom. Ho Chi Minh was able to find individuals and discern the personality types of individuals and choose them as partners or literally as roommates for a short period of time and do so in a way that would create a safe environment. That instinctive ability to penetrate the mind of an individual and, and analyze their character and create a small group around someone for the expediency of survival at that moment is an ability that Ho Chi Minh possessed and I call it nesting. The second skill is extraordinary too, and I call it anchoring. When a movement is in its initial stages, it's absolutely critical to pick individuals that will anchor the group and create stability. There are many groups that never make it past the early stages and that are rolled up by the opposing security forces that are simply fail or lapse into criminality or fail or disintegrate for a variety of political, social, and military reasons. Ho Chi Minh was very cunning and very skilled in this area that he was able to pick individuals from his home province and use them in the beginning stage of his movement to create a level of stability that he was able to build on. This skill, again, is noteworthy and one that should be examined. He also possessed an ability to build his organization through a process of seeding. When he was in his early days in the 1930s, had developed first, I would say prior to that in 1927, the Vietnamese Youth Revolutionary Youth Organization. He then followed that by developing the Indo-Chinese Communist Party. And he did so while he was in China. It's extraordinary that during that time, he was able to not only build his skills, but train Vietnamese youth and send them back to Vietnam and other areas of Indochina. This ability to see, to train individuals, to place them in areas knowing that they will grow and grow the movement, again, is a skill that we should pay attention to. It involves selecting, recruiting, selecting, training, and then positioning and then sustaining the right people at the right time. If you look at the ability of vetting and the ability to infiltrate and exfiltrate these forces and the ability to support operations in this aspect of organization building, we find again another unique skill or a skill done very well by this individual. He also grafted groups into his organization very well. After growing these organizations himself or finding revolutionary groups that had already grown to a certain level of size and influence, Ho was extraordinary at bringing these groups into his movement and further developing his organization. And then lastly, lastly to sustain this type of organization. Now, I don't want for a minute those students who are looking at this, at these skills here, the ability of, to create sanctuary, particularly nesting or anchoring or seeding or grafting or sustaining, and think this was done simply by intellectual skills or intuition or instinct. Those were certainly a major aspect of it. Personality plays in, intuition, instinct. These are all absolutely necessary skills that were being exercised here, but who oh, as we will find out later, was also very ruthless in how he applied this. He certainly used political murder as a weapon to shape his movement, his very own movement. And there are quite a few very interesting stories on that, people that he betrayed inside his movement, as well as obviously those he had killed in other movements. And we'll, we'll get to that a little later. But I would like the uh, students studying the issue of organizational skills and particularly the intelligence areas or indicators that take place in advanced movements like this and 
as we study leadership profiles to take a look at these five areas and begin to explore them and make it a part of your security lexicon because these truly are skill sets of advanced insurgents that certainly are very important to understand when they're operating and they should create an alert and call our attention to this type of individual and what they are doing. This type of skill set when displayed certainly is that of a higher order insurgent with a capability and a level of danger that certainly is above one's peers. And the last area I want to talk about is military deception, sometimes called denial and deception in the intelligence business, or as it used to be called, disinformation, and that term is still used. The ability to deceive and to do so effectively. Ho was a master at doing this. And if we look at his personality cult, the very names that he used, Nguyen the Patriot, even his name Ho Chi Minh, the idea of Ho being the enlightened one, and the very images that he used so effectively, and particularly in his propaganda and speech making, he was able to do this so very, very well. And I think there's no greater fact of that than to simply witness around today when we look at the histories of the Vietnam War and Ho Chi Minh in particular, many of the histories, if not most of them, depict Ho Chi Minh as a patriot, as a humanitarian, as a nationalist who simply was able to use positive influence and power to win over Vietnamese. This, this is simply nonsense and simply wasn't the case. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was a ruthless killer, not much different than Joseph Stalin. As far as their personality types, or I should say as far as the the actions that both took, they were very similar in that they relied so extensively on mass killings to develop their movements. Yet Joseph Stalin, rightly vilified as a mass murderer like Hitler, um, is contrasted to Ho Chi Minh, who certainly doesn't have that stigma attached to his name. And that's simply because his propaganda was so effective, he was able to use it, and it's deceiving people to this day. A striking example of that is his speech he gave after World War II where he stood up and quoted the Declaration of Independence. He also quoted uh, several, uh, I believe he quoted also several statements from the uh, French Constitution. The point here is that to this day there are many people that depict Ho Chi Minh as a nationalist and believe that he was warming up to the United States and we had missed an opportunity. You know, what, what evidence is based off of this? Well, the evidence is that he quoted the Declaration of Independence, and therefore one statement by this man on one occasion allegedly demonstrates his, his uh, warmth or orientation towards the, United, towards the United States, and it's declared a missed opportunity. Very little attention is given to the fact that during this time he is executing, committing mass executions against the nationalist forces inside Vietnam in order to co-opt and to control them. His line of effort of military deception was aimed specifically at targets in the population, the very nation, the region, and internationally. He was able to use his personality, his political movement, and kinetic operations, what I'm saying here is killing and mass killings, to effectively influence those three layers. And again, the, 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 the very ugly aspect of looking at this is, is evident, but we have to call it simply what it is, and that is political murder. To be able to use that with his personality cult and his political movement and do it in such a way as to accrue power and to be able to penetrate these three spheres that I have mentioned here in areas uh, takes a skill. Now, there's no minimizing the, the horrible humanitarian disaster that was created or the moral and ethical dimensions of it. But those interested in studying how political murder is used need to take it to the next level. Those responsible for looking into this subject need to specifically look at this and look at the, and look at the effects of it. Ho was able to use political murder to cripple groups, to minimize their influence. And I think I have a quote coming up or we can look at that. But in this slide, I just want to bring out how effectively he was able to utilize the propaganda images. Here, Ho Chi Minh is depicted as a grandfather to the nation who is especially warm toward children. We in the West tend to look at propaganda 
and minimize its its potency this seems so very simplistic in its design yet it was very powerful in the effect that it was able to create and we shouldn't minimize that propaganda though very false when used effectively and repeatedly in powerful images does have a very potent effect on the population to create loyalties to create allegiance and certainly um, to aid in recruitment here's a picture of Ho Chi Minh during his declaration of independence speech that he gave as World War II ended I wanted to call attention to this elimination of rivals again here's a quote of two Vietnamese generals who write about this in their memoirs and call attention to the political killing that had taken place and when we look at this we see it from a humanitarian from a moral sense and ethical and again it should be looked at that I mean this is obviously a very horrible thing that's taking place but if we look at it from a perspective of effects and what he was trying to achieve and what he tried to achieve it's very similar to looking at a forest fire if you take a look at that image to the right we see a terrible fire a horrible fire breaking out and apparently ravaging a forest but that's not what's pictured there what's pictured there is actually a controlled burn taking place done by experts in order to tear certain things down to clear areas and to g gain control over an area and that is very similar to how the elimination of rivals takes place when an expert like Ho Chi Minh is able to execute these operations what the outsider sees as simply a fire burning out of control is far more than that it's allowed to burn out of control to a certain extent so that a desired effect takes place and Ho Chi Minh was able to do this he was able to not only cripple his competitors he was able to gain access to areas and resources that were critical to the development of his movement we oftentimes simply say he eliminated rivals yes he did that but by doing so it opened up areas for instance his insurgency was able to penetrate not only the south more deeply but particularly the urban areas after he eliminated some of these key rivals and some of these groups that had rivaled his power the effects were an expansion into areas that were previously not achievable the ability to penetrate the urban areas to gain the resources and access to places like labor unions labor groups government officials key officials that were influential in the military at the time period and the government that was forming in the south this was all made possible by these kinetic operations that Ho Chi Minh undertook here's a quote by one of Ho Chi Minh's lieutenants that call attention to the fact that Ho Chi Minh was the architect of the revolution his ability to strategically plan out and to execute step by step a plan again calls attention to his extraordinary skills his ability to manipulate various groups and to be able to have them oppose each other while the communist Vietnamese picked up the pieces and were able to gain a strategic effect is is a skill that quite frankly the communists in their histories boast about at this time but during that period it was very difficult to discern much of this and here's where that strategic sensibility the ability to understand st strategy and be able to operationalize it is found at Ho Chi Minh so what then is the conclusion here I note very clearly that Ho Chi Minh possessed an extraordinary scope of strategic leadership capabilities we're not talking about one particular skill we're talking about many that are used very synergistically and are operationalized and that are able to be applied to critical areas these capabilities included extraordinary personality qualities the ability to develop international support organizational building and military deception identifying hostile leadership I note here with strategic capabilities is essential for US security if we're able if we're ever able to counter this type of individual that may rise again someone with this high-level skill 
that's able to use his forces so effectively and asymmetrically over such a long period of time and then to build those capabilities into a movement that outlasts his his very existence if we're able to counter this we're going to have to identify this type of hostile leadership early and note certain personality skills that are strategic in nature versus some that are far less strategic strategic leadership capabilities if allowed to develop will pose serious asymmetrical threats to the United States we also need to be very clear about this and this is something that we hesitate to do the, the United States is more remedial in its action rather than preventive because there are obviously risks that are involved with taking preventive action at the very least individuals like this need to be identified early rather than coming onto the stage of world history and being able to cause such damage to US security and to Western interests. Thank you very much for listening and viewing this video lecture and again if you have any questions please feel free to contact me and I would hope again that this purpose of this video lecture was achieved and that it kindled your interest to study these topics in more detail and encourage your participation both in your course and with your instructor and ultimately that your, your studies then will go very well. Thank you very much and have a great week.